Okay. We're, there's, people are still coming in, but we, in the interest of time, we want to get started with the program. So uh, good morning and uh, welcome to a National Manufacturing Day event. Uh, I'm Phil Mintz. I'm the Executive Director of NC State uh, Industry Expansion Solutions. I'm also the Director of the North Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership. The Manufacturing Extension Partnership at the national level is a proud sponsor of the National Manufacturing Day events along with the National, I mean, the Manufacturing Institute. And uh, each year, the first Friday in October, uh, uh, the National Manufacturing Day showcases companies all across the country, uh, highlighting how great manufacturing is to our country. So today, we're fortunate enough to be able to have uh, ShopBot Tools have us come in and, and see what they're doing and really show us some exciting work that they're doing. So we're happy today on Manufacturing Day 2020 to showcase the company that designs, builds, and distributes high-tech products from its headquarters in Durham, North Carolina. Now celebrating 20 years of technology innovation, ShopBot's digital fabrication tools are carving out the future of manufacturing, production, prototyping, grassroots making, and education. So we're going to learn a lot more about the company from its founder, Ted Hall, who has quite an amazing story about how a professor of neuroscience at Duke University solved a spare time problem and created a business. So Ted, I'd like for you to come in now and I thank you for letting us see and learn more about ShopBot. Welcome everybody to uh, Manufacturing Day at ShopBot. We're really uh, glad to have you here. We're excited about manufacturing and about Manufacturing Day. And we're particularly excited because it represents the effort that a lot of us are making to bring small and medium-sized manufacturing back to our communities in the US. Here at ShopBot, we make a tool called uh, CNC Router. CNC stands for computer numerically controlled, but what it really means and it's all about is computers controlling machines that precisely cut, drill, uh, machine, and carve a wide range of materials. So there's CNC mills. They tend to be machines that cut blocks of material, usually steel, aluminum, that kind of thing. And then there are tools like ours, which are CNC routers, which are oriented to sheets of material rather than blocks of material, often embedding multiple copies of a part in the sheet. But both kinds of the tools are the same in the sense that they work in 3D, they cut, they carve, they drill, and importantly, they deliver a kind of precision that uh, humans just don't really have themselves. Um, and it creates a kind of leverage for small shops, individuals, medium-sized shops to be much more competitive than they otherwise would be because of the quality of the parts that they can make. You've probably heard a lot about 3D printers. That's another kind of CNC that we, and we more broadly think about that as digital fabrication. Within digital fabrication, think of yourself as a, a sculptor. Sometimes you make things by adding material, by putting clay on clay and building something bigger. That's additive digital fabrication, that's 3D printing. We're subtractive digital fabrication where the sculptor works by cutting away at something to make something. Um, it's all these forms of digital fabrication work about the same. So chatbots are basically 3D printers that cut rather than squirt stuff out. I got excited about what you could do with tools like these CNC tools. Um, over 20 years ago, when what I was doing was actually working in my backyard to make small plywood boats for which this is a model. And the technique I was using to make these plywood boats was a, a, a mathematical technique called um, uh, developable surfaces. And the thing about developable surfaces is if you have an exact shape um, as in a plywood panel in the side of a boat and you pull it together exactly along the lines, then that object takes the design shape of the boat that you were designing or whatever object you were designing. 
the trick is that the cut has to be perfectly precise for the shape to, to happen. So what I was doing 20 some years ago was I had a printer and I was squirting out individual pieces of paper. I was taking them out to my backyard, taping them down on sheets of plywood, and then using a jigsaw to try and cut them out. And it got frustrating because I was having trouble getting the precision of cut and the uh, reproducibility, the reliability, now making one side match the other side, getting the kind of precision that I needed. And I thought, you know, what I need is one of these computer controlled tools that moves mach cutting, cutting machines around that they use in industry. Uh, at the time, I had never heard of CNC either. Uh, of course, now that's what I am practically. But I looked around the area, I was thinking, you know, what I could do is find an old beat up tool and buy it and maybe make that my hobby project. And uh, after several uh, weeks of effort, basically, I found an old beat up uh, CNC tool over in Greensboro. They wanted, well, the thing didn't work to begin with. They wanted $50,000 for it. And what really put me off was it weighed two tons. You know, that's not a tool on the scale that I could put in my garage, or for that matter, that would even work well in a small business. And I thought, you know, these things are just giant plotters, you know, plotters for like moving a pin around. Instead of moving a pin around, what they do is move a router around, a, a tool that spends a bit, a cutter at the tip of it, and allows you to cut things out precisely. And of course, I naively thought, oh, I should be able to make one of those. Well, that was kind of the end of my boat building career, but the beginning of my machine building career. And I spent the next six months or so essentially developing a tool um, that was a, an early primitive CNC tool that I shared with uh, the woodworking club here in the Triangle. And a number of people were excited about it. In fact. Uh, a group of us moved forward with the idea that this is really an amazing technology, uh, uh, an amazing kind of empowerment that we wanted to make accessible to individuals and small shops. Um, you know, we wanted to go from that industrial version to a version that people could use, much like putting uh, large mainframe computers on your desk in the form of a PC. We wanted to put these uh, really powerful tools um, in a kind of situation that people could use. And that's how ShopBot started 20 some years ago. We initially made just kits and encouraged people to build them themselves. But more and more our customers said, we want these tools to build things. We don't wanna get bogged down building the uh, kits. And we realized that this whole thing was about making equipment that for small manufacturing was accessible. That was something individuals and small shops could use. It wasn't just oriented to large manufacturing and volume production. You know, we saw it much more as an extension of what individuals could do that would empower them in a way that made them more compatible, competitive. So um, accessible means affordable. So one of the things we've obsessed about is keeping the price of our equipment down rather than the 50 or $100,000 equipment, something that people could afford and afford to have in their garage, in their small business, in their small manufacturing operation. And as you look at the uh, video that we'll show in a little bit and takes you on a tour of the company, you'll be able to see some of the things we do to keep costs down. But they're like two things that have really been fundamental for what we try to do. One is we make our tools as much as possible modular. Parts that we use in one product, we try and use in another. So I brought it, one example of that um, is this uh, extrusion that we designed that is the main uh, beam that moves the cutting tool um, in, our, in our medium and large uh, tools. And we use this same extrusion um, that has rails embedded in it for a wide range of products from a 32 inch wide tool to a 10 foot wide by 20 foot long tool that's used for manufacturing housing. And by essentially reusing components at many different products, we're able to increase volume and get some costs down. We do the same thing with our electronics and with um, our software. So this is um, a 
control card that runs one of our tools. It's basically the brain of a tool. We use the exact same control card in every tool that we make. Now, depending on the size of the tool and the size of the motors, it plugs into a different uh, uh, interface in the tool. But that same tool, that same control card allows us to uh, focus our effort on the whole range of tools with one design. And what it's also meant over the years is that as the technology improves for the electronics on the card, we can upgrade people's tools just by pulling this card out and putting the next version of the card in, bringing that new capabilities, new speeds, things like that. The other thing we do, and you'll see in the videos, is that we have a strong orientation to lean manufacturing. Lean manufacturing is the word that we use today for the uh, manufacturing technologies developed by Toyota that uh, have been so important in increasing efficiency and particularly in quality of uh, products coming out of manufacturing. Making accessible tools also means making them agile. Our tools are designed in a way that they're movable. They're, they can be pushed around the shop. They can be gotten into your attic or your basement or your garage. Um, they're friendly in that sense, and they're highly configurable. People often call our tools sort of the erector sets of CNC because they can modify them. They can add things to them and so on. But to be effective in a small manufacturing operation, you need to go with the flow, you know, you need to have a tool that can be configured around what you're trying to do that doesn't dominate and dictate how your business is run. And finally, accessible means uh, making the thing as easy as possible for everyone to use. That makes making mean, means making the software enabling. So besides developing the tools, the mechanical aspects and the electronics, we also develop our own software for running the tools that we think is very inviting in terms of uh, putting the uh, tools to use. So as you begin to look at the video that um, uh, explores our shop and how we do manufacturing here in Durham, uh, keep in mind that we do it all right here in Durham, North Carolina. We design the tools, we manufacture them, we do the electronics, we do the software, and we do the support to tools that are sold all around the world. Um, part of that just reflects our enthusiasm for this digital technology, which we believe really leverages the power of individuals and small manufacturing operations. And it's gonna help us bring manufacturing back um, to our communities. The one last thing keep your eye out for when um, you're wandering around ShopBot in the videos is that you'll see many instances of where we use our tools to make other tools. We like to uh, put into practice what, what we preach. Uh, we are big believers in digital fabrication and how they uh, enable and leverage what we're trying to do. So we use our tools to make our tools. And I think we'll invite you to take a look at the video now. Celebrating its 25th year in 2021, ShopBot Tools continues to live by the mission of making the empowering technology of digital fabrication widely accessible and usable. 
We have dedicated our energy and resources to offering the best, most affordable, and configurable solutions for our CNC tools. ShopBot makes design and engineering choices based on thorough reasoning and always with our customers' needs in mind. We engineer, build, and support the tools we sell right here in the United States, in Durham, North Carolina. Unlike any other affordable CNC router producer, we also develop and produce our own control systems and use our CNC tools in our own manufacturing every day. past, CNC tools were strictly industrial tools used in large factory settings. ShopBot's innovations in CNC technology have made these powerful tools affordable for individuals, as well as small to mid-sized shops and manufacturers. We continue to believe that even the little guy should be able to successfully employ the capabilities of CNC, making them more competitive in today's market. The design and construction of our tools is derived from two perspectives. Number one, the importance of mechanical rigidity. A CNC tool does subtractive work. It is a piece of digital manufacturing equipment whose primary feature is shaping components by using a spinning cutter to aggressively remove material. Good cutting force and resistance to deflection during cutting are required as is a smooth and vibration-free motion during the machining process. While pure bulk can be helpful to machining, a CNC tool does not need to be expensive or heavy and immovable to deliver fast, smooth cuts and be a great producer. Number two, the importance of control system software. You hear a lot about smart when it comes to technology these days, but smart means more than just running your CNC tool with a computer. Smart tools take advantage of progress in microcontrollers and programming to enhance the cutting performance and provide the versatility to adapt each ShopBot tool to your workflow and production process. Our software allows your tool to monitor its condition, respond to sensor inputs, and communicate with its operators, making the production process friendlier and more interactive. This is what we mean by smart. We've always been committed to working more efficiently internally. Knowing that, this gives us the ability to make our customers more successful and efficient in their own right. In implementing lean manufacturing principles, we reaffirm our dedication to continuous improvement. Optimizing our processes leads directly to the satisfaction of our customers.
at ShopBot, we enjoy making things. It's something that we share in common with our customers. It takes innovation and dedication to compete in the manufacturing environment of 2020. We know that, as a US-based manufacturer, we can offer better lead times, better support and better relationships with our customers than companies with more far-flung supply chains. We continue to push forward with the implementation of lean manufacturing principles with the goal of continuous improvement to our manufacturing process and the product that we deliver to our customers. On time, complete, and correct is the mantra of our production team. We produce CNC tools for every situation imaginable, right down to completely customized machines designed to fit a customer's exact specifications. But we're also consistently improving upon what we've created. Sometimes that comes with the design of new accessories to go along with our tools. Other times, it is the development of new tools. Whatever the innovation, it's always done with the needs of the end user in mind. And quite often, they are a direct result of feedback we've received from ShopBot users. Since 1996, ShopBot Tools has been developing and manufacturing CNC tools. We believe that digital fabrication is the key to making small manufacturing in our communities competitive again. But what it really comes down to is the success of our customers. That's why we continue making tools for making the future. Great, thank you for taking us on a tour of ShopBot Tools. That was very interesting and cool. Um, so now if we have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat box and we'll get those answered. Ted, while we were waiting, this is Phil. Uh, we can get started with some some stuff that uh, you know I was curious about as you kind of went through your you're getting started and uh, going. I mean, you know, uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, your devices and your products that you made kind of took the place of some of these large bulky items that couldn't be moved around. I, I, said, I, I guess that you kind of started kind of in a whole new part of that industry uh, with your types of mach uh, machinery and, you know, has the competition developed over time and, and what, do you, what direction do you see that going? Well, it's a great question, Phil, because certainly the competition has developed over time, um, but there's a huge market too. And uh, I think it's actually very encouraging that there's so much excitement about bringing, making these tools more affordable and, uh, and more available to uh, everyone to use. Uh, Brian Owen has joined us for uh, people who may be interested. He heads up uh, operations here and uh, We'll be jumping in to answer some of the questions as well. I see. I, I was actually thinking about that this morning, Phil. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things is when you when you develop sort of a revolutionary technology, and you're the only one out there, it's easier for you to set the price based on you know how much you have to invest to get it going. But as the market sort of starts to fill up, and the customer com becomes very savvy then you know the customer really knows what they want to pay for something, and you really have to find a way to deliver. Uh, something at the price that they expect you to. And I think that's where a lot of businesses struggle is making that transition from being sort of the new radical technology to sort of trying to fit into a market with a bunch of other companies. And I, that's a lot of where um, we showed in the video of trying to implement lean uh, manufacturing processes at our, at our plant here to continue to make it viable to produce these things in America, in our plant here in Durham and to support them and to deliver a quality product. Because I mean, for sure, the stuff that's being made all over the world is, is a very high quality. You know, it's not the case that things coming from China or from you know, anywhere else in the world are of low quality. They're very good tools. Yeah. So I think that we're definitely trying to stack up to that, um, you know, to that uh, competition. Great. I think we got some questions coming in. Uh... Susan, are you going to do these or you want me yes. to take them? Okay. I'll, I'll be glad to. We've got one question is, uh, what kind of educational background is needed to work at your company? 
<laughs> I, I didn't see that one on the list of things uh, to uh, pop up. But um, because we're involved basically in every aspect of uh, sales and manufacturing, uh, we basically have people who have practically every uh, background imaginable from uh, PhDs in science to um, um, you know, high school education. Uh, what we're really interested in is people who have a focus on making things. And uh, we see that represented kind of at all levels of the operation. Just about everybody at Shopbot knows how to run the tool. One of the th first things you do when you join us is uh, participate in our training classes, uh, mostly because we wanna give everybody the opportunity to uh, make things with the tools. Do you, you recruit any through community college system or do people basically kind of just show up and, and uh, apply and you bring well, them we're, in? Well, we're recruiting right now for a couple different uh, uh, jobs. So it's a, it's a fair question. Uh, we're interested in developers, we're interested in web people, and then we're just generally interested in good people. Um, because, you know, uh, one of the problems with small businesses, we're about 30 people right now, um, is that, um, we don't have the time to specifically mount recruiting programs in the same way that a larger operation does. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, uh, it's a challenge for us. We have been able uh, during the COVID period to basically um, keep our operations going. We have a number of people using our tools who use them for uh, COVID related uh, medical devices for PPE equipment and for um, items like that. So we felt it was important to keep the support going. So we've been able to keep everybody fully employed for the whole COVID period. And we're, um, we have slots open for people who would like to join us. I think that one of the important qualities that we, that we really appreciate in the employees that we have here is sort of an entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, I, I think that especially our manufacturing team is a really, really excellent group of people. A lot of them own their own tools. They own ShopBot tools at home. They run businesses out of the garage. And I mean, not only does that give them a way to earn some extra income, but I think that it makes them better at their jobs because, you know, one, they are a customer of ours. They know how they use the tools. They know what they want, what they expect. It allows them to perform their job at a higher level. But I also think that it gives them a little bit more of an investment in the company. And it really helps. I mean, it really shows when when they're suggesting improvements and they're finding things that need to be fixed um, and reporting that to us. Great. Next question. Yes. So next question is, how do you address cybersecurity both in your facility and in your control systems? Uh, it's a great question because cybersecurity is a big problem for everybody. Um, and uh, the levels, you know, that it can get you at are, are wide and varied. And we have had, um, uh, a couple incidents over the years where, you know, we've lost money or we've been inconvenienced because of one or another uh, cybersecurity attack. So we certainly pay attention to it. I would say that as a business, we do most of the uh, protective kinds of things that, you know, anybody setting up a reasonable uh, IT operation would do. The more interesting question is about our tools. Uh, they run from computers, so of course they're uh, in many ways uh, available for hijacking. And um, uh, it's a problem that we've thought about at different levels over the years. So the software that we currently provide on, on our tools is uh, a PC app. And a lot of the tools where in, that are in uh, operations where there is a security concern are run on their own um, either local direct connection or local network that essentially isolates the tool from any kind of uh, um, threat over the internet. But as our platforms develop and the advantage of being able to re remotely access a tool for uh, users just to monitor the performance of the tool or to monitor performance of a factory, the cybersecurity issues become a lot more real. And uh, I think we all have to pay attention to it. Okay, our next question is, do you currently have a laser module product? That's for you, Brian. 
Yeah, so you might have seen uh, during the last clip of the video, that was uh, Aaron, who's one of our uh, tech support associates. And uh, he, in particular, had an interest in a laser module for uh, a ShopBot desktop. And so um, for a while, we've been following the, the JTEC Photonics uh, laser module. They make a really high quality laser. It's really easy to install. And he sort of took it up in a spare time project to document installation of that, test it out, um, do a couple of test cuts with it. And so, you know, it's it's available now from JTEC uh, Photonics, but uh, we'll be publishing some specific documentation for how to install it on any any grade of ShopBot in the very near future. And uh, it's really cool that, um, you know, again, uh, that's another example of somebody who is not only an employee, but also a fan of ShopBot and enjoys using the tools. And that sort of personal investment led to some really good things with him uh, taking on that project. Great, great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next question is, would you be able to talk a little about how CNC is now being used in housing manufacturing? I could start that and then uh, Brian can probably uh, jump in. Um, the specific things that we have been involved in are um, uh, all approaches and technologies to building um, that I think are great ideas, but the difficulty comes that the traditions for construction, particularly in countries like the US, are so strong and are so embedded in the culture that even though there may be strong engineering's, engineering and manufacturing reasons to change how we do things, things change very slowly. So in the US, we've had startups for SIP technology. Um, several people bought shop bots to make SIP panels, which are these large um, uh, uh, OSB foam, OSB panels that doors and windows are cut into. The panels are then taken on site and essentially the house is put together in pieces. That works for a number of uh, kinds of projects. Um, there are uh, projects we've been involved in for trying to make the uh, construction more like standard uh, uh, stick frame construction where uh, essentially packages of uh, two by material are cut and machined to be uh, kind of put together uh, like a kit uh, when they arrive on site. Uh, I'm sure you've probably seen some of the pictures on the other hand using uh, the additive technologies where people are squirting concrete or something like that to build uh, houses with giant 3D printers. You know, there's there are lots of interesting technologies out there, but the guild system supporting the current building techniques and uh, building regulations make it very difficult for the uh, interesting uh, CNC technologies or the interesting digital fab or the interesting robotic technologies even to make much headway into construction so far. I think that um, one of the places where there has been uh, a lot of adoption of interesting CNC applications for housing has been in temporary shelters. Um, there's a number of people that have worked on projects for um, you know, disaster relief. Uh, one of our customers in Japan um, built a series of shelters after the uh, tsunami and the Fukushima Daiichi um, reactor incident in Japan to house people that were displaced after their houses were destroyed or they had to evacuate the area around the nuclear power plant. And even um, Bill Young, who's a, a longtime sort of shop bot supporter and fan and, and works with us on a lot of our uh, marketing efforts, he's on the side involved in this project called Shelter 2.0 where you know, his, his idea is that you, know, you can deploy a digital fabrication tool like a ShopBot into an area. You can fly it in there in a crate, assemble it, and all you need is a little bit of power to get it running. And you can use materials that are on site that are available there to build shelters for people that need, um, need housing after a disaster or just um, based on their living conditions. So I think that while Ted's right that there's um, challenges for adoption of CNC in traditional house building. I think that the, the versatility and the agility of CNC uh, make it a great choice for kind of non-standard housing. Yeah, I know your work is international. So do you see that same resistance in other countries or is that a global thing? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
the again the one experience I have I, I've spent a lot of time working with um, some of our customers in Japan and Japan is a very interesting example of a country where people really want to have things that are sort of bespoke and built custom to them they want to use local materials and they want it to be have a natural look to it so there's a lot of very non-traditional housing design in Japan and um, another company that we work with over there called a uh, Vild what um, they're their president is by by trade or by training an architect and so he um, has done a lot of very interesting building design and he has sort of a a tendency to want to use digital fabrication technologies to assemble his buildings and so that he has a lot of really beautiful examples of sort of contemporary or modern houses in japan that have been built uh, using shop out tools So our next question is a, is a three-parter. So um, I'm going to read all of it, and then we can go back if we need to. So has ShopBot had to change suppliers for OTS components like bench sheet metal, motors, et cetera, over the years? Or has the supply chain remained somewhat stable? The second part is, are units made today much like they were several years ago? And how much of that is local? I think I'll take the first part, and then Ted can probably speak even better to the second part. Um, we've been actually very fortunate to have a lot of long-term relationships with vendors throughout the years. Um, there are a number of people that we work with that are located in Charlotte or in Raleigh. Uh, our machine shop that makes the majority of our, our components is located in Eflin, North Carolina. And, you know, these are other, you know, similar size companies to ours. And in, in the same way that uh, we supply parts all over the world, they have all sorts of interesting interesting gigs where you know they supply all the housings for oxygen containers and ambulances. Um, and so we've been able they've been able to sort of grow with us and um, they've continued to supply us throughout the years, which I think that the big challenge for a lot of manufacturing right now has been dealing with the disruption to the supply chain. Um, we've definitely been challenged by our, you know, the availability of components that we have to source overseas, like motors and spindles. Um, spindles come from Italy, typically. Motors are typically from Japan or from China. And it's been a struggle to get a hold of those parts, but we've been very fortunate that our, our local suppliers have been able to keep up with our demand and have been able to keep us running. And I think that it really sort of displays the benefits of, of working with your with local companies and building relationships because of course, they have an interest in us continuing to thrive as a business, and so they want to support us through this time. Yeah, I would just reiterate, we, we have been pretty fortunate in that um, our supply chain has been uh, disrupted, but not quite to the level that it uh, did us in. That is, for a number of items, we've had to go to a second or a third vendor. We've had to deal with difficult logistics, having things, um, you know, air freighted that normally would have been scheduled by ground. And um, it certainly uh, has been a challenge. And even before COVID, uh, we were experiencing problems with the uh, cost of um, raw materials, aluminum and steel um, that uh, were reflecting, you know, trade war changes and things like that, that have made life a little more difficult for us. Um, at the moment, uh, basically, uh, we scramble to keep the supply chain working. You can see the disruption happening in it. You know, we can say that we're experiencing it, but we've kind of lucked out so far. Um, and uh, we, we depend on kind of a, a wide range of uh, uh, sources and subcontractors, a lot of those local subcontractors. Um, and so um, with a few exceptions that we, we do worry about, there's, there's nothing that would preclude us from making adjustments. And I think in our earlier conversation, you mentioned that there are some things that you just can't get in the States now. Uh, there's, and there's some, um, and what, could you uh, tell us again what, what talk to me again about what those things you just can't find they just don't make them here and you sure have to <laughs> we we uh one particular item that uh phil and i were talking about before um is the motors that run the tool on uh, equipment like ours and they tend to be of two types stepper motors motors called stepper motors that have kind of a digital logic to how they work and servo motors which are now mostly controlled digitally um 
And uh, while at the very high end, there are some servo motors made in the US, uh, just about 100% of stepper motors are made offshore. Um, and uh, there are very few Am American manufacturers for them. Stepper motors would be the kind of motors used in say, like printers, um, robotic equipment like ours that's uh, at the low end. Um, and uh, these were all things that uh, 25 or 30 years ago were made in the US but are now offshore. Um, and the COVID situation really became scary because we realized how vulnerable we were and how uh, difficult it would be to get that technology here. Brian and I worked uh, for a while with uh, NC State and uh, UNC on an emergency ventilator uh, for patients, you know, in severe respiratory stress when uh, we were worried that hospitals would be running out of ventilators in North Carolina. And we realized right off the bat that the key component of that tool that we would be depending on um, uh, are the motors and the motors are not made in the US and uh, they haven't been for 25 years, not that they weren't invented here. Um, and it puts the US at a big disadvantage to not have that kind of technology um, locally available to us. Yeah, the reason why I wanted you to bring that up is that one of the things we're doing with our program is trying to encourage, you know, some reshoring activities. But, you know, we want to identify those critical, you know, products that, you know, that it's important if we can get that going back in the states. There's a national effort through the MEP program to, you know, support companies who are trying to do those things. And so we're collecting that type of information. Now, you know, it's, I'm sure it's going to be very hard to bring many of these things back. But, you know, I think there's a big sentiment now that we probably want to do more of that where we can. Yeah. And to, to underline the importance of, of uh, sort of onshoring technologies and making them accessible to everybody, I think that Ted's shared with me many times that one of the real enabling technologies or the enabling developments that allowed ShopBot to thrive early on was the availability of inexpensive motors. I mean, before, um, you know, 30 years ago, they weren't available. And I think that, you know, making sure that these things are available sort of has all these ripple effects where certain businesses start to become viable and you can, you know, develop a new business plan. You can launch a new business because suddenly you have access to a technology that was previously out of your reach. Okay, thanks. If you have other questions? I did have one more come in that is asking, does ShopBot have a mobile demo program that can be offered at local schools once we are past COVID? And Ted, I know you all have last year did a, an open house, so maybe you can share a little bit of information about that as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting uh, to find out when we can go, go back to that sort of thing. We do sell a lot of tools to uh, technology programs in schools to uh, sort of makerspace and art programs in schools and uh, that kind of thing. And we, we sell them to uh, middle schools, high schools, sometimes even elementary schools. So there's a lot of interest in it. And we'd like to be able to go out and share it in the community. We um, uh, have had a, a mobile trailer that we took around to uh, uh, schools in the area for a while, just to be able to share what we were doing with them. And uh, we'd like to be able to, to do more of that. Um, yeah, I can't remember where you covered this or not. And so forgive me if I, I missed it. Can you talk about kind of the, the variety of tools that you make, you know, from a side standpoint or from a, a use, how it's used? I know one of our listeners uh, said that they had a shop bot alpha. And so, you know, what would that do? And, and what other different kinds of variety of tools do you make? Well, I think that um, the, the ShopBot Alpha is, you know, what internally we would always call a gantry tool, which just, you know, is what we call the tools that are that are built large enough to hold an entire sheet of plywood. I think that, you know, Ted's story about building the boat out of plywood um, sort of demonstrates the original purpose of the ShopBot that, you know, it would need to be a tool big enough that you could fit a four foot by eight foot sheet of plywood on it and cut parts out of that sheet of plywood. And so um, that's still sort of our main bread and butter tool. That's, you know, we make those from, you know, four feet by four feet all the way up to, uh, I don't know, 12 feet by 10 feet or, you know, really however, however big we need to make them depending on the person's application. 
those tools are very modular and uh, they also come packed in a crate for the customer to assemble. And so it's easy to build them up into large sizes, even in a small space. Since then, um, we've developed a number of smaller desktop tools, which those um, offer uh, more precision. They are good, great for detailed work, like a wood inlay where you want a lot of precision to carve something out. They use sort of a slightly different drive technology rather than the rack and pinion drive that our large tools use. They use a sort of modern uh, uh, alteration of that, which is a, a lead screw that uh, turns uh, and drives a nut up and down the shaft of the, of the motor and moves the tool around with a bit more precision and accuracy. And we use that same technology on our smallest tool, which is a portable CNC tool called the HandyBot. Uh, there's one sitting on the desk behind Ted right there. And I think that in the video, you saw one being used with a pen to uh, draw out designs on a, on a table. But that tool is just as capable of cutting wood and metal and plastic as any of our other tools, um, but just on a much smaller scale. And uh, we find that that is a, a very popular tool for an education setting where you might want to be able to set up shop in one room one day, do a little bit of a lesson, then move it to another room um, and without having to you know, relocate a whole massive machine. Okay, thank you. So where are we now? Do we have any more questions, Susan? I think that was the last of our questions. So, um, Phil, if you want to go ahead with uh, your next yeah. remarks. Yeah, you know, just want to wrap up, you know, with uh, with uh, ShopBot and just kind of talk about, I mean, you know, do you have some exciting new things that you're thinking about moving into going forward that you can share? Uh, what do you see that, that in your industry going to? I know we talked about construction a lot, but are, are there other other industry applications that you're trying to explore? Well, I think that, um, you know, we were asked about um, sort of the competition and how, how things you know, have developed. And for a long time, you know, ShopBot, I mean, started off as a very distinctive looking tool. And as other companies have arisen, um, we find that a lot of companies look a lot like ShopBot. And our, our sort of motivation has always been to be unique and to offer something new and something that allows people to, you know, take advantage of this technology. So um, we're in the midst right now of some, you know, redesigns to our main gantry tools to try to, you know, in, you know, provide even better performance, provide a quicker assembly, um, make them, you know, faster to get into smaller spaces and just make them more usable, you know, sticking with the philosophy of ShopBot that we want it to be a really accessible tool and we want it to be available to a wide range of people and we want to keep the cost down. We want to make it so that, you know, people can afford these to start their own businesses. And so that's, um, you know, we want to continue to, to stay, you know, to, 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 you know, blaze a path there and uh, provide an uh, ex inspiring example. Ted, do you have anything to add? Are you well, just, I, I or is it, all, is it all secret? No, no. Uh, <laughs> we try and be as open as we can. In fact, usually our problem is that we talk about what we're working on and people expect us to have it ready the next day, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, the development process takes longer and often you decide along the way that, well, that seemed like a good idea when we first started, but maybe it's not such a great idea. I was listening to uh, uh, Rodney Brooks, the uh, famous roboticist yesterday, give a talk. And, um, you know, he was asked basically that question, what do you see as the, the really hot robotic stuff or what, what should people be working on? And he based his thinking on uh, three demographic trends that he thought were a big deal. Uh, the first was climate change. The second was the uh, profile of the aging shape of uh, the world population. And the third uh, was on the movement of people into cities. And he saw that uh, construction was related to each of those and was going to be a big deal. Uh, you know, he made a point about, you know, it. it it's a, it's a tough sell to replace stick frame building of houses, but their construction generally, our infrastructure is much broader for that. And there are probably lots of opportunities for robotic tools in that domain. Um, certainly with respect to uh, the aging population and um, physical things that uh, we need to do in terms of elder care, the, um, you know, anybody that makes uh, equipment in which 
computers are running motors uh, becomes equipment that can be helpful uh, in one way or another in elder care to the extent that can be worked out. And that, you know, uh, moving into cities uh, drastically changes the uh, organization of how we're going to do things. And that's going to be relevant to tools too. I wish I could say we're on top of every one of those mega trends with things we're doing here at ShopBot. But um, I think it, it was a pretty wise perspective on where uh, the action is going to be at a global level. Yeah, great. Sounds good. I think we had one more quick question slip in here at the end. Uh, do you have tools suitable for cutting composite parts? That's actually a question we get pretty frequently. Um, and, uh, you know, we cut things like carbon fiber, um, you know, different kinds of composites. And uh, we frequently get uh, customers or potential customers who send us in samples of material. And uh, it's kind of a, a weekly task here to take the samples that we get in, do a little video recording, uh, try to cut them, see how it goes. And um, so, you know, it, it, it depends on exactly what the materials are that make up that composite. Um, and we'd be happy to give it a try if, uh, if anyone, if whoever want, was curious about it, wanted to mail us a, a sample of the part. All right, it's kind so of a, a, fun, a fun diversion from time to time to get to work on someone else's project for a little bit. So they're saying, send it in. Yep. <laughs> I guess it, can they go to your website to find out where to send it? Is there an address they can get from there? Because sure. Yeah, if you, um, especially if, if you're uh, in communication with our sales team and you mentioned that you'd like a demo to help you decide if you're interested in ShopBot, then they'll uh, contact one of us in engineering or somewhere else in the company who's got some free time and say, hey, can you can you spend a couple hours going over this with somebody and we'll we'll work on it. Yeah, that's great. Well, as we wrap up, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, through our North Carolina MEP program, we are really uh, working to help uh, manufacturers who have been um, affected by the pandemic. And actually, our program uh, received some uh, CARES Act funds uh, that are available for specific emergency type projects. And if you are a company who has lost business during the pandemic or had to shed jobs or kind of in an emergency situation, you have some projects that may help you, you know, rebuild and get restarted again, you're probably a good candidate for some of our um, grant funds. And so we have a link to a survey uh, from our websites and maybe we can get that put up quickly uh, that can actually uh, get you started with whether or not what do you qualify of course this is for you know manufacturers in the state of North Carolina uh, and so we're, we're focused on that at, at NC State University and at, at NCMEP but again uh, we're, we're really grateful for ShopBot to give us an insight to your wonderful business and again I think many people who were on this uh, call actually already have familiar with your parts your your products and and are happy with them and uh you know we're great that you're here in our state uh building this business so we wish you all the continued success in that regard and uh you know let us know how we can help you with any anything that you're trying to, to, to do as far as um building uh your 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 future in terms of uh, machining tools thanks for thank, letting thank us, for uh, us. Thanks for letting us participate, Phil. We've certainly enjoyed help from your organization over the years. Great. So and happy manufacturing. All, guess, uh, happy manufacturing questions. day. Yeah. Happy manufacturing day, everyone. <laughs>